wherever you are. Make it, make it T T T Truth Frequency Radio. What I am about to tell you sounds crazy. But you have to listen to me. Your very lives depend on it. This is not the end. You see, this isn't the first time. Now, we've had this conversation. What day is it? Judgment Day. You just came in with the fresh recruits. What is reality? What is reality? What is reality? What is truth? What is illusion? What are lies? We all perceive reality a little bit different from one another, but there are commonalities which we agree to call the truth. I claim to know nothing, but this is what they told me. And welcome everybody to another episode of Perceptions Talk Radio. I'm your host, John Macedo, also known as Jonathan. <laughs> I never say my real name on air. Um, yeah, welcome back. Tonight, <clears throat> look at this, I'm so for for clemped. I'm like, I'm in shock that I'm even doing this tonight. I'm actually proud and I'm excited. And I have with us, because I never announced my guests ahead of time, Somebody that many of you already know uh, by way of Mark, by way of the Flat Earth community. She's a very special person and it is her birthday. So I'm going to say happy birthday. And it's none other than, drum roll, who do we have? Wait for her to say it. Oh, hi, Patricia Steer. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to introduce me. Is this not your show, Jonathan? No, it is my show. Yeah. Um, no, but... You know what it is? Like you're already established. I'm really not um, in terms of the flat earth. I've always been the wingman. And in bringing you on, um, I have to say, like I said, we didn't really, uh, we've been all working at this together behind the scenes. Uh, Mark's doing his thing. You're doing your thing. Your Google Hangouts are brilliant. I've watched many of them. Um, But you and I really never connected because we were always doing our own thing. Mm-hmm. So recently I, I reached out to you and I kind of offered you an apology. So I'm doing it now on air saying uh, it's not that I didn't regard you. It's just that I didn't know the angle. I didn't know where I fit in um, with you, you know, in the friendship and in the flat earth because I was never a real big proponent of it. But I have to say um, in going back and reviewing a lot of your stuff, uh, kudos to you. I think you've done a brilliant job in 2015 and I'm excited at what you're possibly working on for 2016. And so welcome to Perceptions Talk Radio. Thank you, and you have no need to apologize to me. We had some friendly exchanges via Skype a few times, and I never came away with any bad feeling about you, so there was never any need to apologize. You've jumped the gun on the apology unless you're planning on doing something. No. Maybe tonight. No, <laughs> to I don't know. no this isn't a sabotage interview. This isn't like I Jared know. Spring or anything like that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, behind the scenes, yeah, and, and we have had our moments where, um, you know, I made pictures for you along the way uh, to stir oh, up. yeah. <laughs> To stir some controversy yeah, in the, the flat earth world. And it yeah. worked. <laughs> and it did. Yeah, the spy one with the gun and all that. Because, you know, it's funny. I took that from your store photo. It was on Facebook when you, when you owned that store. It was mm-hmm. a girl with a gun. A girl is a gun in New girl Orleans, Louisiana. Yes. It still exists there. Yeah. Okay. And so I thought it was perfect. I was like, you know, you, you got that mystique. Um, I think I teased you about that too before. I was like, what happened? Like, Miss Steer. I was like, are you Miss Steering the, the community or, is, or was mystique already taken? Um, uh-huh. Funny. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, the funny thing is, is that uh, my name, Patricia, that's the name my parents gave me. And uh, my middle name is Lynn. And my last name Steer. Well, that was my father's name when he married my mother, her last name. But ever since I got involved in the flat earth world, the uh, people that are, well, I don't know, not so fond of me, and there are a few, have said my name is Patricia with the CIA at the end. That means I'm in the CIA. And steer means I'm steering the flat earth community the wrong way or something. But, you know, if my name were something completely different, they would have made up a completely different uh, little saying about me. So it doesn't matter. If people want to believe that my name is a false name created by the CIA, then, then that's fine. I really don't care. <laughs> I really don't care because I know who I am. 
That's good. And you know what? I mean, you're talking about the conspiracy crowd. So you have people that could read anything into anything. Um, they can add up numbers and tell you that it means 666 if it's Ronald Reagan or whoever the heck. They'll come up with an excuse to come to the final conclusion that they already have in their head. Oh, yeah. So um, <clears throat> that said, you know, I didn't want to touch on this whole show and talk about Flat Earth. Um, but I think it's important to open with that mm-hmm. because of, like, like I said, who you are in the community. So – can I start there and ask questions about that? You can ask anything you want. Okay, cool. Um, it's your show, after all. <laughs> well, I know you know I, we interviewed you like Mark and I when it was on Strange World, but I never had the chance to sit in the in the talking seat. You know, to be like Johnny Carson, I was always right. more like uh, Ed McMahon, just laughing. Ha-ha. Hey, everyone loved Ed McMahon. True, true. <laughs> um, but no, I guess the questions I would, I would ask you, like. Mark pointed this out. Like, this isn't uh, a topic. Um, I hate to say it's male dominated, but yeah, what is the impetus or what's the drive or yeah, how do you fit in? Because your persona, like the way I see you, is just so different. Like, you're so artsy and you're so refined and you're so sophisticated and all that. And when you think of like the flat earth, this really is a kooky topic. Like, even though it's hitting its, its stride, it's coming into its own and going more mainstream where people are at least able to talk about it. For the longest time, this was like, the worst of the conspiracies. This is like when you got nowhere else to go, you go to the flat earth. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I totally know what you mean. I, I, I know that I probably at some time, although I can't remember it, saw some sort of picture in my past of a, a ship going off the edge of a, a flat uh, piece of land and like an ancient ship and it put that in the back of my mind somewhere as being what the flat earth was all about and probably saw information about it but just pushed it aside as being, you know, those old notions that were outmoded. But then when I saw Mark's Flat Earth Clues, while I was looking at moon hoax stuff on YouTube, that's how I, I got into it. And even if, thank you for saying that I'm refined and all of that, but it, Flat Earth is not just for the boys. <laughs> flat Earth is not just for uh, you know, you know, somebody kooky or somebody sporty or somebody masculine. It's really for everyone. And it resonated with me as being true and explained a lot of the things in my life, not my personal life, in life that didn't make sense about how the world worked. And I come to Flat Earth really not from a woman's perspective, although I happen to be one. Mm -hmm. I come to it from a person's perspective. And I I look at it that way. So even if I, you know, used to own a boutique clothing store as one of the many jobs that I've had and, and like clothing and fashion and art and all of that stuff. I still like that stuff. I have a part of me that's always been a, a skeptic, I guess. I always saw long before Flat Earth, long before finding out about the moon hoax and other other such things, false flags and, and the like. I always saw through a lot of things in our society and they rang false to me Mm. on the surface and I just always felt a little bit, I don't mean outside of the norm, while living a normal life and looking normal I always felt a little bit different in the way I looked at things. I wasn't so caught up in things that other people found to be absolutely fantastic. I looked at them and said, that's not for me. That seems false. That doesn't seem to be the right thing to do, or that doesn't make any sense. And maybe that's why Flat Earth, you know, kind of fit for me. Well, and and I'm glad you said that. And let let me clarify what I was saying, not so I come off as sounding sexist, like it is male dominated. But what I'm saying is that for me, I've been around the conspiracy circles for 30 years. I mean, going way back to the 90s, even before that, um, when I look at external style events like the flat earth or aliens and things like that, I find that they match the masculine and that men are very external in a sense. Um, when you get into healing modalities and things that are more internalized and that require uh, intuition and intuitiveness and stuff, I find that that's more female dominated as I even see in my own practice in the arts. Um, it takes more of that, that feminine um, deeper wisdom to trust and what I'm hearing from you now, the way you put it, is that you seem to have a certain faith in this flat earth movement that other people are looking, let's say, for the answer where they want exact measurements, the exact uh, calculations for the curve. You know, they're trying to figure it out from the analytical scientific end. But from what I'm hearing from you, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you're seeing that there's this human connection to it. there's this human spirit to it all that's driving it that's why maybe it's picking up now like yourself people always sense that there's something wrong that we've had a false narrative presented to us 
and that there's something deeper here beyond just the shape or the size or the scope of a flat or round earth. Is that correct? Exactly. You are completely reading that right. You are very perceptive, and I guess that's why that... Uh, Hence the show, Perception Talk show Radio that, with Jonathan. Exactly. <laughs> but it's true that I look at it, and even the, the show that I do, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes on YouTube, um, I, I interview people in the Flat Earth world, people who have new channels, people who have established YouTube channels on the Flat Earth, and people who are interested in Flat Earth and other things. So I talk with them about that. And I do it from the perspective of, of a curious person. It's not all about flat earth and measurements and experiments, although we do get into that. But I want to find out about the person behind their belief system. So in a way, it's kind of a bit like perceptions in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I do have critics who say that I don't talk about flat earth, strict flat earth with, you know, calculations and measurements. But to me, although those things are important and someday we'll, we'll maybe be able to get, if you're a flat earth believer, that is, a, uh, a, a view, you know, an eagle's eye view of, or I don't know, a space shuttle eye view of the world on which we reside and be able to see its exact shape and measure everything and all of that. But to me, that's not as important, although I encourage people to continue to make maps and the like. But what's more important is the, and this is, sounds like a feminine thing, you know, since we're being sexist here, the emotion, the feeling, and the connectedness of the people involved in the Flat Earth Movement and those who are not involved in the Flat Earth Movement and perhaps uh, telling them about it and seeing if it resonates with them. Not trying to get them to join like a groupie or as part of a cult or anything, but just... Right. You know, exposing it to them, seeing if it, you know, ticks boxes for them. And then maybe they will think, wait a minute, this makes sense. And then become flat earthers. Or they'll say, wait a minute, this is crazy. And then go do whatever they want to do. I don't hate people who believe that the earth is a ball because it wasn't too long ago that I believed the same thing. So I, I understand that perspective as well as the flat earther perspective. Surely. And, you know, like yourself, um, yeah, I, I appreciate what, and again, hence my show Perceptions, where people are coming from. Because especially if they're successful in their own right, whether they own a business, <clears throat> have a successful marriage, uh, whatever they do, um, not only can I not judge them, but I have to analyze a certain aspect of themselves and say, well, what brought them to this place equal or above where I am at in my own life? If their beliefs are so different than me, even diametrically opposed. What I'm saying is that it's like that saying water rises to its own level or life will meet you where you're at. So that the way we approach, let's say, the flat earth or how we go about to, to figure out whether it's flat or round, it doesn't matter what tool or what approach we use, but if we come to the same conclusion or not, right? So I, I, I talked my way into a circle on this one. Mm-hmm. I didn't mean to go down this path. I, yeah, guess what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is for myself, just like yourself, when you said, you know, until recently, you believe that the world was round or, you know, you were satisfied with that. I still live in a space where I'm operating from the spirit. So, and I want to say this the wrong way, but to say that I don't care if it's flat or round, I would say that it's more important to me that I'm a better individual each day. It's, it's more important to me that I treat my son fairly. It's more important to me that I serve strangers the same with, with compassion. And you see what I'm saying? The, the shape I'm of the earth, you. yeah, the shape of the earth doesn't matter. So that when, in that sense, in the human, in the human, uh, I'm with you in all of those things, treating people uh, well and with respect, and and those sorts of things exactly. But I also add the flat Earth to it. In my world, I can have, I can do all of those things, and other people, you know, you know. So I don't have put a limit on on that. So, but yeah, I'm a big believer in in that. Uh, I, just being kind to one another. It's a huge part of my life and always has been, although, you know, just like everyone else, I'm a human, lose my temper sometimes, <laughs> you know, in my past when my parents were alive, I'm sure I yelled at them. Well, not even I'm sure, I remember exactly. Uh, you know, it's just the usual things we all do to other people in our lives that we regret, hopefully, if we have a conscience, sure. and try to better ourselves and not be like that in the future, and just caring about people and not just listening to them talk about their problems engaging with them yes. and and yep. helping you know if if you meet a stranger somewhere and they start immediately talking about their hawaiian vacation let's say in a grocery store somehow mm-hmm. they're saying like i'll be like well what what is that thing you're buying in a store and she'll say oh it's um frankincense uh oil i'm buying it because i'm going to hawaii and I want to, you know, do some kind of a, a t- you know, some kind of spa and sure. use this to rejuvenate, rejuvenate myself. In, 
she wants to talk. I'm just going to say it's a she. She wants to talk about her Hawaiian vacation with you. Mm. And if you just say, oh, cool, frankincense oil, and talk about the oil, you've robbed her of what she really wants is the human connection to talk about the most exciting event in her life right now, which is planning for her Hawaiian trip. So I try to look at everybody and what they're talking to me about and, and see what they're really wanting to talk about and go to them from that point because that's how I want people to treat me too. That's <laughs> you brought up so many ideas and I'm glad you said that. Um, you know, it's funny cause that's like the difference between listening and hearing. Mm-hmm. Like you can hear somebody, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily listening to what they're saying, reading between the lines, so on and so forth. Like you said, it's about the trip or her emotions. The frankincense is just a, right. It's just a placeholder. A lot exactly. of times we, we have things as placeholders when we're really, it's the same when somebody's angry, like when, and I wanted to steer it in this direction. Um, the trolls that I see and all these people that have so much angst towards this topic. And what I was going to say to you when I said I didn't care about the flat earth or the round earth, and now we're talking about compassion and caring about other people. If in my own relationship, let's say here with Melissa, we have the business together, we have this relationship. If this flat earth concept bothered her so much that she hated it or said, I can't stand that you do that show, I would walk away and say, you know what? Everything I have here is so much more important than the, than the discomfort I'm, I'm doing with this, this one thing that I'm so adamant about. You see what I'm saying? I would just release it because she couldn't understand it, if that makes sense. Um, what I'm getting at is when people have angst on anything, it's usually of an emotional nature. And you have to try to get to the root of what that emotional cause is. So with the trolls <laughs> that attack uh, you, obviously, uh, Mark, the same, uh, I don't get hit as much because I kind of step out of the way, it seems. I always try to understand where are they coming from that they're so angst ridden when they don't seem to have an investment like you or I or Mark does in trying to find the truth about the flat earth. That is, if you're not interested in the topic, why would you invest so much of yourself and in effect, let us own a part of your soul? (laughs) Yes, I know. Um, I I don't understand it either. I don't understand that anybody who dislikes something on, on such a such a, a level that the trolls dislike anyone speaking on flat earth would ever devote any moment of their time looking at videos, commenting, mm. and, you know, just feeling that anger and hatred and the, the, probably the cortisol that's boiling up in their body, sure. creating all sorts of illnesses as they do so. Uh, I don't understand why anybody would do that. I don't go to any uh, YouTube channel that has a topic that I dislike and start Put, putting comments there talking right. about how much of an idiot anybody is on that on that uh, channel. I just don't look at that channel if I don't like it. But that's just me. Other people feel that it, they could maybe change a person's mind. But yeah, we can all change a person's mind. But by calling them a moron, that's never going to change anyone's mind. You can change a mind of a person by just introducing a new topic to them. Uh, and then hopefully, if that's what you wish to achieve, you can achieve it by allowing them to then use their mind to think it over. Sure. But, you know, bullying, and that'll never work. Never, never, never. No, and, and that's the thing, meeting them back at that level that they're at. It doesn't help. It just fuels it. Uh, like they say, feeding the trolls. Mm-hmm. But again, I've it, fed the trolls myself. You know, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done it too for fun. You can't resist sometimes. I've done it. I've done it. I don't, I've not done it for fun. I've just been so incensed at something a person mm. said that I naturally reacted. Uh, I don't use profanity or anything like no. that. But I've naturally reacted with a very common sense answer. And then, of course, that starts a dialogue. That is exactly what they want. And then you're like, oh, gosh, I, I need to walk away. And, you know, then they're saying, oh, you don't have anything to say. That right, must right. mean you're guilty or that must mean you know you're stupid. It's on and on with it. It's very negative. You, and you, I try my best to just ignore you it. And that's you know my, you know my favorite, what I do. You know what my favorite comeback is? Like mm. after I bait them a little bit and I feed the trolls. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> some, some, along, some along those lines. Yeah, I love Pee Wee Herman, by the way. Um, <laughs> right? That was Pee Wee Herman? Well, yeah, many people, but Pee Wee Herman did do that, made it uh, uh, kind of famous. Um, I'll say to them, I'll say, you realize I own a piece of you right now, right? Like even now you're continuing to read this sentence and you're looking to see where it goes next. So in your mind, you're thinking, what can I come back with? At the end of this thought, proving that I own you right now. I'm still captivating you. You're still reading this. You, and you see what I'm saying? And they're, and they're following the sentence and they have no choice, but they're compelled to finish it. Yeah, that's so, true. And that's it takes true. them down that road. And it's like, now I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you an out. You don't have to respond back to this, but just know it's going to linger in your mind that I got the last word. in. so what do you do now? Ooh. Do you respond and prove that I own you? Or do you walk away and show that you have more strength? You can't. 
it's going to bother you. It's going to eat you up it's, inside. It's, it's a paradox. <laughs> you know, it's like, if you, it's like, okay, you want to play that yeah. game? I'll play that game. Yeah. I mean, I could do that, I guess. I, <laughs> instead, I just delete them <laughs> and walk away, go do something else, anything else, go pet my cats, read a book, take <laughs> a walk outside with some trees and nature. You know? and, and by the way, and I have to say this for the record because I have seen some positive comments on your walls, especially from uh, male viewers or listeners. No, that's not true. I have a lot of women who no, 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 enjoy no. I'm, as I'm just, well. No, I know, but I just look at the male comments because I'm male. Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't present myself any sexual fashion. No, no, I'm not saying that. So I'm not that. looking for male attention. I don't want anybody to think that. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is I got, <laughs> I got a new mic. I, by the way, I apologize to the audience now because it turns out all the problems I've had with Mark the past few months, uh, there was a short circuit in the microphone I had as much as I, you know, I bought one of those nice mics like you have. Uh, I've you got some, um, it's called the Blue Blue Bird and you bought the Blue Yeti. I bought the Blue one. Yeti, yeah. Right, right. And so what happened was the mute button had a short that was then connected to the volume. You couldn't turn it off. It had all these parts. I replaced it, and it works flawlessly now. And you can hear me pretty clear. Um, oh, totally. You sound great. What I was going to say, though, is now I have you up close and like right in my ear. I know you're all the way down in Texas. Mm-hmm. But um, you do have a great voice. I'm across in Texas. I'm not down. We are not on a ball. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> oh, where's my manners? At least in my mind, we're not on a ball. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, you're across the way, uh, across mm-hmm. the horizon. Oh, wait, there is no horizon. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, there is. That's, you know, that's the hard part about anyway. this whole thing. It's like it's almost like pronouns in the gay community or the transgender community. I was having that with the show that I had. I had somebody on who was a famous transgender in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And we discussed all these like pronouns. And she says, yeah, I don't even get into it. She goes, I, I can't even figure it out myself. And I was laughing about it. But you know, I feel like the same thing in the flat earth. If you slip up and say the word globe, if you slip up and say the word horizon, like there's people. Well, that, horizon's okay. Flat Earth has a horizon. Yeah, yeah. Where the I, I guess I don't I know guess so. the, where the land meets the sky, kind of, where the water meets the sky, something along those lines. You know what though? Uh, no, see, I look at it from a, a photographer's perspective, and I said this to Mark uh-huh. recently. When we see light, right? Like today, and I use this in that talk I was talking about. I was telling you about the poetry slam I went to. I was uh, showing people the spiritual qualities of seeing. And like when you think you see something, you don't actually see it, but you see the reflection of light coming off of it. Hmm. The same way a camera works. If it's mm-hmm. dark in a room and you don't use a flash, what do you get? Darkness, right? So I'm standing up there at the mic and I'm talking to this audience and the guy dims the lights. I said, see the difference? Now you can see me less. So what you really see, you're not really seeing what you think you see at the first point. When you're looking at light towards the horizon, reflecting off the mountains, reflecting off the water, whatever, that light starts to fall off or drop off, right? Because there's also pollutants in the air, fog, uh, things that you can't see, but at a distance it becomes hazy. Okay, mm-hmm. so it blurs out, whatever. Now, when you see a light that's focused into a beam through a lens like a laser and it's amplified behind it, so it's directed at you, now you can see that thing at a greater distance. Hence why you can see an airplane. I don't know if you've ever seen like an airplane coming from a distance and sometimes they'll have it like a plasma flare and you swear it's a UFO. It's so freaking bright like a flare. Oh, yeah. I've seen you ever that seen this kind phenomenon? of thing. I, I always think, oh, wait, it's a UFO. Finally, I'll right. see one. And then right. I'm like, wait a minute. Right. There's no way you'll ever see one, number one. And number two, <laughs> that's a plane. <laughs> right. But, but you, you get my point. Like That thing's miles away, but you, you can see that blinking strobe. It's cause, well, that's why. Mm-hmm. But you obviously can't see the outline of the plane itself. Why? Because it's not daylight and there's no light reflecting off it. So... When we say that we see or observe things, what is it that we actually see? That's the first question. And so our eyes even, you know, we interpret things in our, our brain and actually we see everything upside down through our lens and then it hits the back of our eye and it goes up to the brain and it flips it right side, right? So there's all these variables. And I'll give you one more. When, do you look in the mirror daily? I'm a woman and that sounds sexist, but yes, indeed I do. No, I'm saying we all do. <laughs> right. But from, that's a negative reinforcement just like the globe in the classroom is. When we look in the mirror, we're not actually seeing ourselves. We're seeing a, re- a reverse image. So That's when we true. think we're combing our hair to the right, we're actually combing it. Well, we are, but you know what I mean? In the mirror, it's not really how it looks. There's something called a true mirror, and I brought this up recently. Are you familiar with this? Yes, I am familiar with it. In fact, I heard you talking about it, and that's how I learned about ah. it. Ah. Well, yeah, the true mirror is yeah two, two other mirrors on the side that then reflect in the center. However it's configured, you can look it up on Google Images. Um, but it, you actually see yourself the way you actually look, and you're like, holy crap. When It's so unnerving to see yourself in that. Because now, like, the scar over your eye, whatever it is, it just looks different, um, the reflection. 
Uh, so yeah, I guess now I never thought about this in a true mirror. I guess if you had a word on your show that said Nike, it shouldn't be reversed. It should come back at you as Nike. I always think when I look at people too, I'm looking at them and just, if if I don't know them and I'm looking at what they look like, Mm. but they know what they look like, at least what they think they look like, but they also have in their mind who they are and what they feel and what they feel they're projecting. So what I think they look like look like is different than what they think they look like that's a good based point. on who they are and i know i know that from when you meet a stranger and then later you become good friends you look at them differently because you understand the things they do and how they walk and how they move before that when you didn't know them when they were maybe walking toward you you might have seen them more like who they really are before you got to know how they want you to perceive them you sound like you've been listening to Perceptions Talk Radio. Like you seem to understand. No, I'm I mean I've listened to a few no, I'm just times, kidding. but I mean this is these. Are, I think about this is right things. up my alley. This is the kind we, of guest I think want. About, we think about these things a lot. Most of us do. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's we're coming up on the first break, but I want to come back and touch on that. Let's talk about nuances and perceptions and what we think we you know like you were talking about with people, and uh, let's take it in that direction, see where it goes. It's also, your show. also, take do you us where you will? Do you want to open up the phones, or you want to keep this exclusive to you? Um, if you would like to open up the phones, I'm totally comfortable with that. All right. Next segment, folks, well, I'm going to give you the number, 866-37-TRUTH, 866-378-7884. I'll give it again at the start of the show. And we got Patricia Steer and other hot potatoes on Reception Talk Radio. I'll be right back. Perceptions Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jonathan. Uh, second segment ready. They, they, they go fast when you're having fun and you're having a great conversation with somebody. And uh, if you're just tuning in, we're on the air with our guest, Patricia Steer of, what is it called? Flat Earth and Other Hot Flat Potatoes? Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. That's the thing. The worst, best can, name ever. Can you, say, can you say it one more time? I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> you know who I'm imitating, no. right? Yes, yes. I certainly do. Yeah. That's awful. I won't that, man, that's no an need to awful, mention. Awful, awful that mess. Person. You should give him some fashion tips because he is awful. Uh, I anyway, don't really care what he does. I don't care does either. I, I still don't care. Um, I wish him well. <laughs> I do. I wish him well. It's sad though. <laughs> you know, when you get to that point of your career, it's like, look, look, look. Wait, let me just say this. I'm not going to name names, right? You know, like when an actor, it's like those tragic comedy movies where the guy's at the, you know, the top of his career. So everybody's kissing his butt. He is like, you know, like a Howard Stern type, somebody big, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, like, they just go through whatever they go through that they reach rock bottom, you know, and so they're pulling out all the stuff and they're doing crap like that. Like, you know, magic acts in like truck stops, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like, is that the best you can do? Dude, it's like you were at the top of your game and you put out like really salient, like important clues and all this other stuff. You led like a whole group, you know, you had your own, you know, following and forum and it's like, really? Like. That's like, you know, bottom of the list stuff. When well, it's a stylistic decision that some people make. And all you need to say is either I like it or I dislike it. And you like it and you embrace it or you dislike it and you don't pay any attention to it. So I don't pay any attention to it. All right. Well, you know, some people resort to self-immolation uh, too. So if you want to try <laughs> that, I would pay to see that. <laughs> Sorry. That's always an option. That is an option. It's a way out. <laughs> try, to, try not to think of it as suicide. Try to think of it as euthanasia. <laughs> um, <laughs> or anyway, so we're talking about nuances, about people, 
about energy is about um, being perceptive and, and picking up on all that. Mm-hmm. What, what is um, your spiritual bend? Because I find for me, the idea of the flat earth, um, it reinforces my belief in God, not from the biblical sense like uh, Rob Skiba and other people may, because it's in the written word. Mm-hmm. I, I, I tend to operate and believe um, in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. For instance, when something is dogmatic and religious, and you know, religious or um, rigid, uh, it has a tendency to destroy and corrupt more than it heals. Uh, for example, if a lay person goes into a courtroom and they're using plain language and speaking from the conviction of their heart and their true intention, the same courtroom and a good lawyer can turn around and use those words against them, against them, and put them into a construct of the letter of the law, meaning it'll have a legal context, and therefore they may actually be. Um, what do you call it? Hanging themselves for lack of a better, you see, for saying too much. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is from a spiritual standpoint, when I hear about the flat earth, it, it gives me this idea that guess what? There's a defined structure to it now, meaning that there is a divine plan, right? Defined divine. Um, there's something more to this whole thing. It's not a simulation like Mark has alluded to. But obviously, and if you look at nature, and I know you're vegan, we'll, we'll touch on that in the next segment. Um, somebody really put some thought into this whole experience that we're having. Somebody really offered us an incredible playground or sandbox, if you will, if it's so immense and it's so well designed for humans and all species. So spiritually, I guess what I'm asking you is, how does that tie into your beliefs with the flat earth, or does it? Well, it does, but also this really is a structure and I'm not saying that you need to believe that there's a dome or any of those things, but this is like our bodies are a structure. Mm -hmm. We have a system in our bodies. We've got the blood system. We've got the, the lungs, you know, the, the air system. Uh, We've got all of this going on in our bodies. We're kind of a machine. We're a human machine, and I'm not saying well, it is I've transhumanism heard, uh, or anything, but we are, a, we are a structure, we are a creation, and the earth that we live on has also been created, and it has all of these systems in place that work very, very well. We humans can mess them up, but these things were put into place and are continuing to help keep us alive. We have the sun, you know, we have, we have the water, we have everything here that the food grows. I mean, food grows from dirt. Think about it. How crazy is that? No, not for nothing. And, and uh, I'm only teasing with you, so don't get hurt. But I did hear that uh, somebody said that you may be a robot or an android, sophisticated model. But I've uh, heard. I've heard that I could be everything you could ever <laughs> imagine, except for what I really am. Right. Which is- a 53-year-old single female with three cats who lives in Houston, Texas, right. and is a very calm, nice person interested in music, art, and fashion, and well, flat earth. Well, no, That's what, what, what I am, but the things I hear that I am, it's, I could make a huge list. We won't. It's boring. Nice. You know, but, no, Mark's not here to, to back me on this, and I know <laughs> you're not good at movie trivia, uh, but did you ever see Blade Runner? With yes, Harrison? I've seen Blade Runner. Okay. Mm-hmm. As Sean you, Young. Exactly. As you're speaking, mm-hmm. I'm picturing that scene where Harrison Ford is interviewing or interrogating Sean Young, and she's staying on point the whole time, the same way you're keeping your poise. And I'm thinking, is she an android? Mm-hmm. Well, there's many times I won't have answers to questions, and I'll just say, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> especially when it comes to movie trivia. But I did know Sean Young, who you're speaking of. I loved her, by the way. I thought she was a great actress throughout her whole career. And, uh, if you followed her when she got off of it, I was actually uh, in correspondence with her for a time. She was oh. she was really cool. I mean, she would send out pictures to her fans and people that knew her, uh, you know, on movie sets and different things she was doing behind the scenes. Like she's just she's a real person. Like she's a really strong person, and uh, I really admire her. I like that. I admire that kind of a person as well. Yeah. There's not that many celebrities these days that I admire. But then again, I don't follow celebrities. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are some great ones. I just don't know enough about them to know how great of a person they are. But there are uh, women anyway and men from the past that I like the way they conducted themselves in public anyway. Probably their private lives lives were a huge mess. But the way the Hollywood uh, setup was back in the the, the days, the golden age of filmmaking, it was all managed and hidden. and, And you can find books on it and read about it now. But back then, they appeared to be very composed, maybe oh, yeah. android-like people in a way. 
So and you know what's funny because you you you're kind of as I'm hearing you speak that um, I could see you back in that period kind of in that Hollywood you know persona um, carrying your I don't know like uh, not Audrey Hepburn what's her name uh, Catherine Hepburn yeah I like Catherine Hepburn I also like Audrey Hepburn I like both of them quite a bit. I mean, Breakfast at Tiffany's is my all-time favorite movie um, in that genre. And that um, it's just a smart movie, uh, and I love her. Yeah, I love does, her too. Does that mix a vulnerability mixed with, um, you know, uh, street self, smarts? Self, yeah, moxie. Yeah, moxie. Ooh, that's a good old Hollywood word. Dame. A, She's dame. a dame with moxie. <laughs> well, I'm a Scrabble player, so moxie with an X. Forget it. If I can get a triple score on that, no one uses the word moxie anymore. I do. Well. And Zoftic. Oh, that would not be me. I don't no. have that super curvy figure. I'm no, but Marilyn more on Monroe the Audrey Hepburn side. Marilyn Monroe was like a 12-14 and so was uh, Sophia Loren. Right. But, but the 12 and 14 of the day then was different than it is now. Right. So. It was, it was, it was all well put back then. Now it's all McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, and stretchy pants. Sad but true. <laughs> yeah, sad but true. Yeah. Hey, but stretchy pants are uh, a good thing in some ways. Um because they're comfortable. But yeah, they have been known to be abused. You mm. see that often on the streets in, mm. by both men and women, of course. But let's get back on track. So, so spiritually, like, what is your spiritual bent? We go from stretchy pants to spirituality <laughs> here on the perceptions program. It's all <laughs> it's over the place. It's about perceptions. It. <laughs> I turn my head and I'm looking at the sun. I don't know. Ah, uh, spirituality. Okay, well, um, I was brought up just a regular average... American who I guess would be called Christian, but we didn't really go to church. Maybe on Easter occasionally when we were really little kids. I grew up in the 60s, so back in the day when you would go to church in the 60s, you wore white patent uh, shoes, flat shoes as a girl, and white tights and a little tiny purse. Did your, dad, I, did your dad give you a dollar to put in the basket? I think he probably did. I can quarters. vaguely remember that. Yeah. yeah. You know, just that kind of thing, and it, I didn't really get much out of it other than looking at the big stained glass windows kind of with awe, but we didn't have much talk about God at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did say the uh, prayer before we went to bed when we were very little, which was, now I lay me down to sleep, right, I pray right. the Lord. You know that one. Um, there's variations of it, but we said that one, and um, that was pretty much it. We had a Christmas tree and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Easter, that kind of thing, but my mother was Jewish. Mm. She converted before I was born when she married my dad because they were going to have children and they decided that they would, because my mother's family was not really around, so her family wouldn't protest. And my dad's family wasn't so happy with my dad, a Christian, marrying a Jew. This was back in the 50s, so it still happens today. So she converted and then their three kids were raised Christian. And you know what what, what I'm hearing more um, than like the religious aspect or spiritual aspect, and this is important, even more so, you're talking about tradition um, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, even the Christmas tree, all the things that you celebrate and so on and so forth. Sadly, I feel like if if only for that reason to do these things, decorum, all of it, um, it's nice to have tradition. I miss that. I miss what Christmas used to represent. I miss when stores were closed on Sundays and that when you got something at Christmas, it meant something because you waited all year for that big sale. Whereas now you can go onto Amazon and if not Amazon overstock and if not overstock eBay and there's always, there's always a sale going on. So there's really that specialness is taken out of it. Like even my, even my son, not that he's spoiled, but he knows at any given moment he can now use that card he got at Christmas, the, um, what do you call it? Like the little credit cards that they give you. Like a gift card. A gift card, a gift card. And say, Daddy, let's go to uh, GameStop or something. But but it doesn't mean anything now. And it used to actually mean something to go and do these things. What about the TV programs that you would wait for? like Oh, Rudolph. uh, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Miracle on 34th Street. Exciting to watch that. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Uh, And you know what was great? There was only... Those seven channels, um, whatever the hell yeah. it was, you know, coming in on the rabbit ears and stuff. And uh, if you got it and it was clear, I mean, praise dad for, you know, going up on the roof. And he would. Men used to do that. Real men. Oh, I remember <laughs> my me. dad going on the roof. Adjusting the damn antenna yeah, it's I'm cold. surprised more fathers didn't kill themselves accidentally. Right. Especially, I lived in Michigan, slipping off an icy flat roof. We had a flat roof. so. But how cool was that? There was no DVR, right? There was no, like, I'm going to watch it later. Right, there was no Netflix. You but, had to make a plan. Thank you. 
gather around the TV like they used to right. gather around the big stand-up radio right. during Roosevelt times right. and, and have an, a, a family event. The TV in my house anyway wasn't on all the time. It was only on for you know, event type things. We didn't just watch programs. I'm talking about in the sixties and early seventies. As time progressed, it became different, especially, you know, uh, around the time I moved out, which was around the time of MTV starting. Mm -hmm. Then at that time, the, the kids who were all older, uh, had, you know, uh, the basement, uh, was taken over, you know, for the kids, the kids room, you know, where we had a TV down there and you could watch it 24 hours if you want, because my parents would never notice. So things definitely changed. And hey, I love the 80s too. A random question. I actually think all these time periods have some really fun and exciting things. I think I grew up in a great time. Random question. Mm -hmm. What was the first video you ever saw on MTV? Video killed the radio star by the Buggles because it was the first video that they played on MTV. It was, but you actually saw that as your first video on top of it? Yes, I did. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it was mine too, to be honest with you. Uh, I remember watching MTV and being transfixed by it. That sounds really superficial now, but I can remember, I can almost feel that feeling in myself. No, but it's it, so it, it, fascinating. I wanted to be a VJ. You would have made a great VJ, a VJ, by the way. You would, and I saw how you looked. I mean, you look great now, but you have, I guess, like I'll just say it, a certain persona, and you had the beauty, you had the looks, no doubt, but you have the poise that goes with it. Not, not everybody always has the two. Like I could see you as a VJ, laughing it up. Being on point, totally into music, um, yeah, and you know, and I'm saying this too from looking at when when you do go on screen, you have the Wurlitzer, I think, behind you. Oh, that was my father's uh, Wurlitzer jukebox, seventies yeah. jukebox. It was in his radio station in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That's in right. The lobby. I forgot about that. And then when my parents both died, my father died in 2008, and my mom just died in 2014. And uh, at that time, all of their possessions were divided among the three kids in the family, and I'm the eldest. And that was the thing. You got I all the wanted. music, huh? Well, I didn't really get any. I got the music that came in the jukebox, but it mm-hmm. wasn't anything I wanted. I just wanted the jukebox, and my parents both knew that that would, was to be mine someday. All right, so, random, random question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting to know Patricia Steer through Jonathan. <laughs> I don't uh, want to bore anybody with like, it's all about me. I don't care about anybody. This is about Jonathan. Whatever. This is Jonathan <laughs> okay. and Perceptions Talk Radio. Then my apologies. And if you apologies. listen to NPR like Jonathan does, then you're finding this interesting to, to hear somebody speak. Well, my apologies if anybody is thinking I'm only talking about myself. You are asking questions. Oh, I'm asking saying. the questions now. But yeah, we can go to any other topic we want to. Yeah, we will. We shall. Random question number two. Oh, and by the way, I'll tell you what, to up the, up the ante so it's not just me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, can I ask you random questions? Absolutely. Wait, yeah. Right. One eight six six thirty seven truth eight six six three seven eight seven eight eight four. Uh you can call in and then you can ask questions and say, Hey Jonathan, shut up. Um <laughs> No, in that jukebox of yours. Yes. What is the rarest record or whatever you have? Is it records, right? Little forty five. It's records, uh, forty five records. What the, is rarest the rarest one like- in there. Um, when I got the jukebox, it was a little bit damaged in the trip from Kalamazoo, Michigan to Houston, Texas. And I had to call somebody and an expert here in Houston to kind of fix it up a little bit. You know, it got dinged around in the move. And um, I didn't like any other records that were in it. It just seemed to have a bunch of junk in there, I thought. And they weren't, it wasn't valuable emotionally or uh, monetarily. It was just kind of some records that just weren't my cup of tea. So I went on eBay and then bought uh, 45s from different people and then they all started coming in and my mailbox was full of all these 45s because it holds 50 of them and okay. I bought a few extras in case something was scratched most of them were used 45s anyway obviously because people 45s aren't you know something that's commonplace in record stores mm-hmm. if there are record stores I know there's a few still but the rarest one I've got was actually written by my grandfather what? a record written by my grandfather uh, my grandfather Howard Steer owned WKMI radio station in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right. He, he had it built and then owned it and ran it. And his son, my father, uh, didn't work for his father, went off on his own doing radio, kind of one of those things, the only child, the only son wanting to prove himself. But then later on, when uh, my dad's dad, my grandfather, was getting older, uh, was getting ready to retire, was getting a little uh, sick, but not too bad, he, uh, my dad came back to Kalamazoo, Michigan and started running that radio station. So my grandfather commissioned as an, I guess, an advertisement for the radio station, a, a jingle, I guess in radio terminology, right. that's a, a little song that has an identifier in it for the radio station or TV station. Sure. And, and this one was, uh, 
uh, a song about Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, Michigan, which Get is out. the town. And it's a really cheesy song, but it's really cool. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's rhymed and it's got these, you know, male and female singers singing a chorus about Kalamazoo and WKMI radio station. All right, no, wait, 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 wait. Now, now you've hmm. more than piqued my curiosity. I can't play it. It's right behind me. That's exactly it, what I was going to ask you. I can't you. actually stop it without pulling the jukebox away from the wall and then turning it off. It doesn't have an off switch in the front. Uh, so, what, would, yeah. what would it take in your own time to possibly just, because um, you have a great mic there, mm-hmm. plug it in and record it one day in a digital format and then send it to me? That would be cool. I can give you a line from the song. Okay. It's, WKMI has the modern sound of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, and all around. Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, big finish, that's my hometown. And it's really cheesy. I mean, I'm not a singer, but you can get an idea. Of no, I, can, I, can, I can hear it, it in my head. I can definitely hear it. You know, because I've listened to a lot of this song, already. Naming the little towns within yeah. Kalamazoo, the little, little small areas. Uh, you know, like this one is cool, and this one is cool, and this one is cool. You know, and then it wrapped it up with that the radio station was the modern sound of this town. <laughs> I, I got to say something though. Kalam- that's the rarest song that I've got in there because my, my own grandfather wrote it. The rest of the, the stuff that's in there is more things to my taste, like yeah. 45s from REM, the psychedelic sure. furs, uh, oh. some Radiohead, Bjork, sure. the Smiths, of course. Smith, yeah, the Smithereens. Uh, I think it might have a Smithereens song Blood in there. Blood Roses. I love that. Song. Um, no, uh, but not that one. No. Um, I even have the sneaker pimps going into the 90s. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a bunch of different stuff I liked with no particular uh, other than just things I like. Any Portis head? I love I like Portis head, but no. It's too, uh, no. it's too, I don't know, it sounds. I know what you mean. Too, it, the jukebox is a, if you looked at this world, it's a jukebox. It's a bright and happy thing. Right, so it right. kind of needed, well, I wouldn't understand why I would have Morrissey in there, though, or the Smiths. That's uh, not bright B-52s. and happy. B-52s. I, I never liked them. I no? never liked them. Wow. Love Shack and all that. It was it was too fifties campy for me. Okay, wait, wait, wait. How about World Click, uh, Lady um, Miss Care? I didn't like that either for the exact same reason. Huh. but you know, different perspectives. Did you do the eighties thing? Did, re- did you do the club thing? Because I know I was out here in New York. I used to hit the limelight and all that that fun. Well, uh, I mean, in the eighties, I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay. So, and then I moved to Florida. Excuse me, not Florida. That's the place I lived before that. I lived as a as a young girl and teen in a combination of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Florida. Just wanted to explain that because I said Florida. What I was attempting to say is I I lived in the eighties in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then I moved away to California, but oh. not a cool place like San Francisco or L.A. I moved to Modesto, California. And my apologies to anybody who lives in Modesto, California. It's the Central Valley. But it's the Central Valley. It's between the places that are interesting and exciting. And it's where, you know, it's the breadbasket kind of. It's mm. where things are grown. There's walnut farms and peach farms. Walnut uh, uh, farms, ranches. What's the word I'm looking for? Groves. Plantations. That's, <laughs> what's the, that's not even a, we'll just use the word groves. They grow them there, the trees. Right. And peach peach is growing and it's it's very rural right outside of Modesto. And Modesto itself is a city, and I'm sure it's quite more advanced than it was when I lived there. Uh but American graffiti in part was filmed there. Oh yeah. So, you know, it when uh, when I live there, it still retains some of that look, but I, I, I haven't been back since then. So I spent part of the 80s there. And so you're asking about clubs. Um, I remember when I was in Michigan in <laughs> high school, I went to a club called Club Soda. <laughs> and that's where you could go uh, as, a, as a person who wasn't of drinking age and then okay. dance to 80s music, you know, when you're quite young. And that right, was right. very exciting, you know. And by the way, Kalamazoo, I like that word. Uh, it's just fun mm-hmm. to say it rolls off your tongue. It's um, Potawatomi Indian, I think, for pot of boiling water or are, something. Are you serious? Like yeah. Kalamazoo. Yeah, I'm serious. And it's I'm funny because I, I have words that I like and I have words that I hate. Um, Me too. Oh, really? Let's, let's go over some, some of the words that you like. All right. Can I give you a pet peeve word? Yes. I've got a few. Okay. Buckle. Because when I hear buckle in my head, I hear buckle. It's that <laughs> <laughs> buckle. I hate that word. I don't like the word yummy. <laughs> Yummy. I don't like the word tummy either. I don't like any E words like yummy, tummy. You know, when I hear yummy, I picture some uh, Japanese girl with a guy like going (laughs) and eating like Nissan soup. (laughs) It's so yummy. I don't know why. (laughs) 
You know, Cup of Noodles reminds me of the 80s and maybe the late 70s. That was a big but, deal. Remember that when it first a, came out? Oh, I mean, I'm vegan now and don't eat that, but they yeah. do have vegan brands. But I, oh, I remember that stuff. It was at the time so good and so cool. You could put boiling water in it and have a hot meal. Exciting. <laughs> Hmm. The things we were excited about back then. I know, Cup right? Noodles. Now, you know, it's not a treat. Now it's if you want it, you just go to a, you know, a convenience store and get it. Right. And if you're living off in college, I mean, you're, you're really basically living off plastic. I mean, it's not even healthy. It's, it's, it's awful. Oh, um, and Cup of Noodles is, is three different kinds of meals. You can make the soup by itself. You can make the soup with noodles or, you know, you can just eat the noodles dry. So that's three different meals in one. If by the way, I, no, you know what? Let me say this. I have had somebody made this incredible, um, it was vegan for the most part, salad that had cabbage. There's no such thing as vegan for the most part, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's like saying, well, it's kind well, no, of it was, partially no, dead. No, no, it was, no, I'm saying it was vegan, but it had um, uh, ramen noodles in it. So I don't know what ramen noodles are made out of. You know what? I don't know. I think probably yeah, someone might have an animal product in it. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. But what I'm saying, what they did is they took it and they crunched it. It, it gave it a certain crunchiness to it, and they did it with like a white vinegar, and it was actually really good. So I don't know. Well, people can make ramen noodle dishes that are really, really wonderful and good. But I'm talking about the old cup o noodles. Oh, you know, cup you just noodles. peel the top back, and then you pour the boiling water into the brim, and then close the top up, and the goodness magically is created there. And then you eat it. While watching MTV or something. <laughs> but you know what? As, as far as uh, eating goes, and I've, I've been vegan before. Um, I'm actually getting back into uh, a franchise I had invested in back, God, 2002. I was really pushing for a fast food vegan restaurant because there's nowhere to go around when you're traveling down to Florida. All you have are um, Cracker Barrels and, and uh, Waffle Houses. But I've been the, in a Cracker Barrel before one time. <laughs> really, it's one of those moments you want to slit your wrists. But that's just me. Don't want to insult anybody. Well, who I like the, the no. Barrel. I like the way it looks, and I'm not going to lie. Um, I've had the chicken and dumplings like special on Sundays, and it was what was nice about it. You know, it's not so much the cuisine. Of course, it's just processed food, but it's the ambiance, like that that old country store kind of. You know, down home family thing. Like, there's nothing really for me to eat there except some wilted well, yeah. iceberg lettuce and some graying tomatoes. So it was kind of bumming, bummed out. But you know, those cross country trips when you're driving, mm -hmm. I've moved from places like Michigan to California and drove, and there's nowhere to eat. There's nowhere to eat. And you know, that's why this, this restaurant thing, I'll, I could talk to you more in the sec, uh, second segment. But I wanted to ask you about um, your beliefs in, in food ecology and, and your personal uh, ethics and beliefs on, on veganism, um, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's spiritually based or just health based or whatever reason um because it is important I, I remember reading uh diet for a small planet was the first book i really opened my eyes to the mm -hmm. situation uh but for me personally i've never wanted to be preachy about telling people what to do i've always tried to just lead them to um a natural conclusion like if you try something and it's like oh wow this really agrees with me i like this or i really feel healthy you see what i'm saying like i want them to make the choice so that they're then empowered but you can yes. only, but you can only do that if you present them that option. So that was always the uh, the drive behind me doing the fast food vegan restaurant. I want to subvert people's appetites back to a healthier way of eating without forcing it upon them. I want to be them so great to have a fast food vegan restaurant that Absolutely. was that stayed away from processed and had a lot Absolutely. of organic. Imagine that. And I don't mean like restaurants, you know, like McDonald's and other places. They try to offer like a vegan offering or a vegetarian offering, and it's like, wait a minute, dude, you don't seem to get it. Like, I don't think there's anything at McDonald's that would be vegan. You can maybe get kids' apple slices, but that's probably <laughs> preserved with some kind of nasty, noxious chemicals anyway. Yeah, just GMO. To keep the it, apples it, from rotting. It never ages, yeah. Well, listen, when we come back, let's talk about veganism and let's talk about health and uh, let's continue. Yes. All right. We're on with Patricia Steer. Everybody hang tight. Come back. And uh, I'm going to open up the phone lines again. So stay tuned. Truth Frequency Radio. So 
Welcome back, everybody. Second hour, Perception Stock Radio. I'm your host, Jonathan. And on with me is my very special guest, Patricia Steer. Bong. It's a very special episode. <laughs> I heard something go, bong. Were you in the kitchen? Oh, no, no. It was, uh, I think it was the heel of my shoe hitting my uh, my chair. It's one of those chairs that, uh, I don't know, it's You know what? Scuts. I could see, see that. Identify that yeah, sound. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah, like exactly. radio, like um, Prairie Home Companion, where they do... Uh, Noir radio, the detective, and they do oh, all the yeah. sound effects. Or it could just be one of those radio old t- radio shows where they make a noise, and the, the you know caller number nine has to guess what that noise is, and then they win the you know the jackpot or something. That's pretty cool. Have you? By the way, have you ever seen that show live, uh, Prairie Home Companion? No, I have not. I'm not a really big fan, actually. I have listened to it on the radio before, but right. um, Garrison Keillor, I think, is the yep. uh, the host. Yes. I, I like him. He's incredibly talented, but I don't like the um, the format. I don't know if it's called folk music, or oh yeah, uh, that music. Yeah, I don't like it. Sorry. So, some, no, sometimes it's more clever than others. Depends on what the topic is, but the intelligence and and cleverness, yes, is completely there. It's I think it's the the music that yes. makes me not want to listen to it. No, I agree with you there. But I, I like highbrow humor. I like uh, really intelligent. Me too. Intelligent, I like that too. Um, yeah, and you know what was cool though, was seeing it live. When they did do it, um, they did that segment where the guy would tell a story and he'd see the shoes and he would take an actual pair of shoes and walk them on a piece of wood and then he'd have a door and he would slam it like he's walking into the door. Like It was really neat to see. Love that. That yeah. would be really great. It's really theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like along those lines, I mean, they made a movie, Prayer Home Companion, but um, that troupe that does uh, Best in Show or Mighty Wind or um, have you seen any of those movies? I've seen Best in Show, yes. I yeah. think I actually own that DVD. Yeah, and it's funny because those are like really great actors, comedic actors. But again, it's that really intelligent humor, and it's like, yeah. Anyway, I also like lowbrow humor as well. So I mean, when uh, Beavis and wait, Butthead first brow? came out, oh, well, when it. Beavis and Butthead first came out, I was <laughs> laughing so hard tears were rolling out of my eyes. Wow. So that's like, you know, that's stupid humor. That's not even. Low I know. Brow. Well, I like all sorts of different humor. It depends on my mood, different times in my life, um, you know, that kind of thing. That's good range. Yeah, That's yeah good. I guess. <laughs> but you know what? Let's let's talk about serious matters. Let's <laughs> let's let's act all prim and proper here. And let's mm-hmm. no, um, yeah, nah. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about we were going to turn the subject matter to uh, veganism and the way you eat and everything in your dietia. Uh, let me do this real quick though. Let me give out the number eight six six thirty seven truth eight six six three seven eight seven eight eight four just in case I missed anything along the way. But I want to turn the topic towards nutrition and eating and go. Well, the reason I'm vegan has nothing to do with nutrition and health. It has actually zero to do with it. Fortunately, luckily, that is a side benefit. The reason I do it is for the animals. So I say that I'm vegan for the animals. I've seen the truth of what happens to them and I can't be a part of it. Now, all my life I was a part of it. I wasn't really aware or maybe I was just, um, I don't know, willfully ignorant because we all know animals die if you eat steak. You, cannot, you can't just forget that, but we do forget it. Mm-hmm. We, we don't really, when you think of a hamburger or you think of, a, you know, go to Taco Bell or whatever people do, you don't think of where it came from and that animal, you know, having a mother and a life and, you know, I don't want to turn people off. I don't want to make people dislike me. Uh, I don't want to make people think I'm preaching. But the reason I'm vegan is because I saw things that made me feel disgusted and horrified. And I just want to, as much as humanly possible, remove myself from that circle of death. 
um, other people do as they wish. But I do encourage anybody who's thinking about veganism, whether it be for the animals or for their health, to watch some things from uh, Gary Yurofsky. You can find him on YouTube. It's last name spelled Y-O-U-R-O-F-S-K-Y, like Gary Yor of Sky. Mm-hmm. It's easy to remember. And he gives speeches in many different places, but he does a lot of college campus speaking. I think and, I've seen him on YouTube. Yeah, he's, he's pretty... Yeah pretty popular and he will explain the the moral dilemma now a part of his presentation will have him showing a gory film but if you don't want to see that because you know it right, exists right anyway you don't need to see it you can skip past that and oh. then just get the information and he'll also explain to you why you don't need to eat any of it in order to be to remain healthy but uh, you know as i said earlier it's up to each individual to make decisions yeah. When I, I first, st- before I started on YouTube, oh, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, sorry. I just want to say one thing. It's like, um, mm-hmm. I'll, I can fill in the gory details, not that we have to go there. I mean, you're, you're making the point perfectly. Um, but that option does exist. And unfortunately, I've seen those films. Like, it's almost like a shock doctrine. It's supposed to shock you into reality. And mm-hmm. I think it's unfortunate because <clears throat> people's minds, when people change, let's say, from a, eating a, a healthier diet to a poor diet, it's not usually like overnight. It's usually just lazy habits. Let's say you know somebody goes away to college. Now their parents aren't making them dinner, so they're fending for themselves, and it's easier to just get a microwave thing or this or that, and they start eating poor and poor and whatever. So the same with these, these movies that the, you know, PETA and other people make. It's absolutely true, and it's supposed to present a point like, wow, this is how stark or you know, how, how strong it is, what's happening in these, in these factory farms and so on and so forth. But I think it's so off-putting and so damaging to the psyche that people can't even bear to look at it. Well, it's, there's it's, a, a movie called Earthlings that's really um, in your face and explains and shows the, the real horror. I've never actually watched it and became vegan without watching it. Some people can watch that movie while eating a hamburger. So it's all depending upon the individual. Um, it's sort of like the flat earth in a way. You can explain the flat earth incredibly well from whichever perspective you choose, Mark's perspective, Mark Sargent's or other people with their different models of the flat earth. You can explain that to somebody and show them proofs and do experiments with them about there being there being no spin of the earth and no curvature and that water remains flat. To me, those are the three biggest proofs and what I focus on. I don't really focus on models per se. And that same person will just not want to look at it or explore it. They'll be, oh, that's interesting or well, you're crazy. And then they'll just go in with their life. Same as veganism. You can show them the goriest film of animals and how they're treated or you can explain things to them in a more calm rational manner and if it's not if the time is not right for that person they can walk away or say you're crazy mm. it, it's the right time and place where the information hits a person who also happens to be receptive and that moment where they meet is when a person can actually change and, and that <clears throat> beautiful points i mean you, you put that perfectly and you know that's what i was starting to say with the fast food vegan concept uh, at the time, the guy who was cooking, he was a master, master chef, uh, would make these faux meats that people would come and eat and say, oh, my God, this isn't even meat. Are you kidding me? Because there were still those cravings for, for bacon or hamburgers or whatever the heck they ate, right, mm-hmm. chicken. Um, and, but yet, ethically, uh, there was no harm, no foul. We were just presenting a certain cuisine with a certain flavor profile. Now, I'd said to this guy, Mark, his name was, I said, this would be great if we could do this on a large scale because then we could subvert people's taste buds and appetites over to more of vegan cuisine and then eventually elevate that palate and start to introduce other options that are without meat. You know, because you wouldn't jump somebody, it's just like sushi. You wouldn't give people like roe and like the hardest sushi to eat. And that's a poor, in this example for veganism. No, no, but I totally get what you're saying. But with veganism, you wouldn't introduce people to, let's say, beets or maybe, you know, something really complex. You might start them with simple things that they've already eaten. Like uh, Thai lent- food. Lentils you'll or Thai people, food. or Thai food, you'll give them pad Thai before you go right. off on something else. Yeah, I right, get exactly. what you're saying. And so, yeah, so you elevate their taste buds. And then, you, and then once their body starts to adapt or even crave because of the nutritional value, then it just takes on a course of its own. Um, so, yeah, the uh, I guess where I'm going with this. There's that ethical component, like you said, like the, the whole animal factory farming. Um, but we, here's the thing, and I'm looking at it from an industrial and from a broader standpoint, right? There's seven 
plus billion people in the world. We think there are, but I really don't know <laughs> if that's true or not. Okay, well, that's just the census. Territorially that's the minded. Yeah, that's the number they gave us. But, um, you know, when I go to the store and I see all the chicken that's, let's say, in the supermarket, the local supermarket. I feel like I'm in a morgue. I, I, I've almost, on some days, I'm more sensitive than others. I can actually walk by the meat department. I try to avoid it. But if you have to walk by it to get to something else, there are certain days when tears actually come out. Uh-huh. And other days, I'm a little more re- calm and reserved. Is it okay to talk about this? Or I don't want to... Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm not like okay. that. Okay. It's just seeing it. I th- you know, I, I say something in my mind. Boy, people are going to think I'm insane. I say, I'm sorry, friends, when I walk by. Well, here's the thing. Um, when, when I, I think su- about that, I say, I'm sorry, friends, when I walk by all these animal corpses. Because they're really our friends, to me, anyway, even if I never knew them. I just feel sorry. It's a morgue. So, <sighs> Yeah. Do you, want to, do you want to take a moment of silence? No, you know, I'm not going to cry. It's no, 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 because dead, dead air on the radio is a no-no, but for this, I will make an excuse. <laughs> no, I, I just want to impress upon people that it's something to think about. You get it, dead air? Uh, it was a joke. Yeah, yeah. No, I got it. I got it. <laughs> totally got it. No, what I was going to say is, no, you're yeah. absolutely right. Um, but what I wanted to say is when I look and I see all the chicken and the meat and the different things, I think to myself, if this is only one store... How many chickens are there in the world or how many cows or whatever are, you know, what I'm getting at is when I drive down the highway, and this is the way my mind works, right, my, my crazy perception mind, I'm looking not at that aisle of meat in a particular supermarket like you've just said, mm-hmm. but I'm driving down the road and I'm picturing like the walls of buildings with x-ray vision and I'm saying, oh my God, another restaurant, it has chicken. Oh my God, another uh, Chinese food buffet, it has chicken. And as I'm going down the highway, I'm thinking to myself, how can there be this many damn chickens in the world? Yeah. Right or yeah. shrimp or shrimp is another. It's like where is all this? And this is just one highway in one state of one town, or you know, one town of one state. So I'm thinking to myself, the world over, how many damn chickens are there, and how many are you? Know, see what I'm saying? Like, there. What I'm saying is like humans for the longest time, and I was almost like leaning towards the way in the conspiracy how the elite think. Right? They want to do a world population culling. In some circles, that they talk about this magic number, uh, 500 million people. They want to bring it down to. Mm-hmm. Georgia Guidestones. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. And, you know, I hate to say it this way. If you consider that there's millions and millions of other species on the planet, the most dangerous of which is the human being, that we kill off not only each other, but every other species in order to survive. Uh, that doesn't mean just killing them directly for a food source, but also the environment they live in, the Amazon clear-cutting, uh, the dumping in the oceans and the rivers, so on and so forth. Um, calling the human race in a sense, if you want to say that every being has sentience is not such a bad idea. Okay. I'm not trying to say I advocate that or want that, but when you think about the responsibility of living, uh, coexisting with all other beings on this planet, if there's an alien race, I've said this to Mark too, and they're monitoring us and they're monitoring our behavior, whether it's under a dome or from afar, or even, uh, they're here already amongst us. We're not really doing a good job of showing that we're capable of getting along with other species throughout the universe. I mean, the narrative in the movies is that there's a monster out there and they're going to come down here and they're going to eat us, right? That's always been the, the scary thought. What if there's insect type aliens that are going to come down here and use well, us for food? The monster's us. That's the thing. We are the monsters. We, you know, we, we do it all the time to other creatures and it's our biggest fear. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think? Because the internet has really exploded in so many ways i don't think exponentially the the powers of be thought it would go the way it's gone do you think people are waking up and what can actually be done to really change i don't know people eating meat without being political without i guess without doing everything that's been done already like what well, more well, needs to be done when i first uh started facebook in 2000 gosh i think it was 2007 i can't remember i started posting vegetarian stuff and then later when I became vegan, I was posting vegan stuff because I finally saw the horror of what the dairy industry and, uh, you know, the dairy and egg industry, which I was still eating as a vegetarian, what that was all about. I never saw it before. And then one day I saw it and couldn't unsee it and changed immediately and became vegan. But I was posting things. I was posting what I ate, you know, the organic food and maybe smoothies I was making just to try to encourage people. But I was also posting those memes 
harsh memes showing, you know, a cow being I've seen killed. Yeah. You know, I was posting those as well. And somebody might say I was a militant vegan. I wasn't a militant vegan in any way, really. I'm the same <laughs> person you hear talking to you right now. Right. I was still, you know, with a light touch trying you, to... You weren't, you, weren't everyone. Thought, you weren't throwing red paint on people's fur no, coats? No, 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 no. That happened but to my I, aunt, by the way, in New York really? City. Really? She, she had a faux fur on. And these two kids threw it on her, and she was going to an event. She was so livid and angry, she sued them. And she says, you know what? And she didn't really actually do this, but just to rub it into them, she says, I bought a faux fur with my good conscience of what I was doing. Now, because of this act, I can afford a real fur, and I'm going to buy one. Oh, wow. And she just said that just to rub it in on them. But it made them think twice. Yes. You know, anyway. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I can tell faux fur from real fur by looking at it. But you said they were kids. They probably couldn't yeah. tell. And they were filled with that righteousness and wanted <laughs> to do something that made that mattered. So I, I get where they were coming from. Right. I'm not the person throwing, you know, you know, red paint on people or screaming killers, or, you know, at a protest. But I am a person who, you know, will educate as much as I can or not educate. That sounds like I'm a teacher. Just inform. Give somebody an idea, present an idea that they might not have thought of before. Not, not for nothing, and I was though. You, you would look good veganism. With, you would look good with a whistle around your neck and a, a cute little beret on. <laughs> well, what I would do would be something along those lines. <laughs> Just put some information out there and allow people to make their own decision. And some might have seen two, some of the two, pictures four, as militants. Six, eight. What kind of food won't we masticate? Meat. <laughs> Meat. <laughs> That's pretty Ma- good rhyme Ma- you came mast- up with. There. I'm, I'm good like that. I'm really good like yeah, that. Yeah, really good. Masticate means chew, people. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Everybody should <laughs> masticate daily. Mast- <laughs> masticate as much as you can. It's healthy. Unless you're a breatharian and then you just live off the air. Oh, like Sunpar. Yes. In fact, some people can. And some people, I mean, I'm not saying that I know this for a fact because I've hung around these people, but there's documentaries like like who, who, you, who you speak of. Yeah. People who um, get their energy from staring at the sun, sun sure. gazing. Mm-hmm. Um, also, there's people who will um, drink their own urine. Yep. Um, there's also people who will drink water and l- look at the sun for, you know, their, to keep themselves alive. And there's people who go through periods of time that they do that. And then they go back to eating. Then there's raw vegans. There's vegans with cooked. I'm, I'm a cooked vegan. I am raw sometimes. Kind of a mix. Just I've, like we were I've, talking I've, about laziness. Sometimes I'm more lazy and I go into a habit of where I'm eating like lots of easy to make cooked food, maybe some processed vegan food. It's organic, but it's still processed. Every, everything you're saying I've either studied. I, I know by rote. I know all this stuff. Like when I was saying on one show, I know everything. I'm not kidding. Like like yourself, <laughs> I'm well studied. I, it runs the range or the gamut from whatever, you know, from the unhealthiest to the healthiest to the, to the extreme. Like you're saying to breatharian, to fasting, to water fasting, to you name it. And it just fascinates me because, again, there's so many people on this planet and so many different ways of living that the human body can can survive. I think uh, ad- it's a, adaptability to what's a what's good given experiment to. to try some of those things. Absolutely, uh, yourself. I mean, go a couple of days um, with just on a water fast. I mean, you're not going to die. No, I and mean, you know what? Let me say this. And for people that I, I helped somebody recently, I'm going to have him call into the show next week. This guy John, he tried the borax uh, conspiracy. He went to that website. and He tried the protocol. Mm-hmm. This guy had psoriasis long term and all these other ailments. He's going to come on and talk about it. He said after like a week or two, like all his symptoms started reversing completely. Like he couldn't find relief for years from doctors, from shots, you name it. And people he's going to, should look that up. The borax, oh, the, the conspiracy. borax conspiracy. Listen, people, mm-hmm. if you try it, um, I can go into it. He's going to explain brilliantly next week. We're going to talk about it. There's another one that's weird too that I don't know a lot about, but it's turpentine. turpentine. Using turpentine and kerosene, for the same thing. kerosene and turpentine. And now it sounds insane. Yes, it sounds. No, insane. it's it's brilliant. But, when you read it, it's it, it actually makes proof scientifically. Yeah, it makes um, sense. There's a lot of there's a hydrogen peroxide protocol mm-hmm. as well with a 30 percent food grade. Yep. I've done that one. As well, it supposedly kills cancer. Does it or not? I don't have cancer, but you know, I, no, I didn't I've have seen, it I've before. Seen the, I've seen the protocols with baking soda and molasses, even, or, yes, or you know, and it really does. The, the, the cancer, uh, the fungus based ones or whatever go after the sugar, or you know, they go after the molasses, they come into contact with the high pH level, the alkalinity of the baking soda, and they literally, under electron microscopes, have shown they explode and it doesn't damage any of the healthy surrounding tissues. And you can alkalize your body simply by you know putting a little baking soda and water and drinking that. Well, but you well, shouldn't borax, rely on that. No, you no. But borax, borax is 9.3 pH. Borax is incredible. 
You can't go crazy with any of these things. No, 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 no. I'm not really advocating saying take them. Read it and look yeah. into it and look at the pros and cons. And but a lot of the cons are put there covertly by the pharmaceutical industry. Of course. You will see fake reviews. You will see, well, you won't know they're fake, but you will see, you know, I tried it and I almost died kind of comments. And most of those are not from real people. Yeah. Now, do I have proof of that? But but you know, think about it. The the, the the pharmaceutical industry does not want us curing ourselves. They want yeah. to medicate us and cut things off of our bodies and put us in, you know, to chemo or whatever. That's how they make their money. And by the way, when, I, when I'm telling people out there, when I say the Borax conspiracy, let me just point one thing out. This gentleman's protocol is to use one heaping. I'm going to tell you what it is real quick, and this is important. Mm-hmm. Borax itself can be bought. It's the 20 mule team borax that you see in the detergent section. They put it there for a reason to, again, reinforce that negative fear that it's bad for you, that it's detergent. Uh, it's actually trisodium borate. It's found in the, the lake beds and stuff, and, and particularly 20 mule team borax. You needed 20 mules to take enough of it out of the dry lake beds to town to make a profit. That's why they gave it that name, first off. Second to that, you can get it for like five pounds for under $5. Okay, All of these things are very inexpensive. They're so cheap. Yeah, the pharmaceutical industry can't make a profit on it at all. Right. But here's the thing. He makes... It's one tablespoon per 32 ounces of water, and he takes about six to 10 tea, teaspoons a day of the solution, and that's it. He's not even drinking like 32 ounces of it. Six to eight t- teaspoons. And again, all his symptoms are reversing completely. Uh, aches and pains in the joints, everything. He's going to come on and talk about it. But here, here's the thing. All these things are available to us, and if they really taught people like in high school or at some level food chemistry and food ecology and how simple it is to treat the body, we wouldn't have a need for doctors. We wouldn't need the pharma school industry. We wouldn't need a lot of surgery and stuff that could be reversed before it gets to that. I agree completely. I'm all for those sorts of things. I'm I'm very much involved with all sorts of organic things, natural products or not even products just using things like organic coconut oil as a body moisturizer oh, to uh you know use it uh, put it in your mouth and you know swish it around right. in the oil morning pulling. when you, you oil do pulling. oil pulling yeah yes i do when you wake up um i'm i'm interested in all of these things and when i find out about them i look at them and i measure in my mind if this is a valid thing or not read up on it i don't just and, jump on it like a trend and, by the, and by then the way, i me, incorporate it if i find it to be let me, of value let me just add this for those of you who don't know about oil pulling you can use coconut oil safflower or even sesame I like coconut the best. Myself. Yeah, I do. No, I do too. Because course. I use that for other purposes. I use it as a hair conditioner. Sure. I use it for body, lips. Sure. You know, it's it's just there in my bathroom, so it's easy to. But I'm just I'm just bringing up the other two that if somebody doesn't have, let's say they don't have a taste for coconut oh, yeah. oil, they can't get it. For those of you out there that have either poor dental hygiene or you can't afford dentist or insurance. But oil pulling, you put uh, about a teaspoon in your mouth, you swish it around, you pull it through your teeth like you suck it through. You don't swallow it, but you do this for about three to five and work, try to work up to about 10 minutes. Uh, some people even say 20, but I find... I do it while I'm taking a shower. Exactly. I, first thing yeah. in the morning, make your first movement, get in the shower, then spit it out. It'll be like mm-hmm. a milky white substance. What you're doing is pulling out all the bacteria and all the crap that's affecting your teeth and, and causing cavities, but you're also enabling the teeth to start uh, regrowing the um, enamel and becoming stronger so that the gums, any kind of loose teeth and stuff like that, the gums start to strengthen and your teeth feel solid. They'll actually look whiter and even your taste buds, it'll, it'll strip stuff off your tongue so that you don't have that residue or that, that crap. Um, so it's an amazing thing what, what oil pulling can do. There's also turmeric that you can buy powdered or you can buy it yourself yes. and dry it and powder it yourself. Depends on your level of laziness. And you can brush your teeth with that. And that's supposed to help whiten your teeth and clean them. But a warning, make sure, from personal experience I've learned, <laughs> do it with a toothbrush that you keep in your shower and do it in the shower. Mm. Because it stains your teeth. Well, it doesn't stain. It will... M- it will discolor, you know, clothing that you might be wearing, your toothbrush. Right. You should reserve it strictly for using with the turmeric powder. So do it in your shower so the, the orangey color doesn't fly off and stain towels and such. So it's a cool thing to do. It supposedly whitens your teeth. I'm not sure if it does or not, but I know it's not going to hurt me, so I do it. All of these things I've not received huge benefits from, but... I do all of these things and maybe I'm as healthy as I am now because I do all of them. I didn't have Preventive like, problems like the friend that you're speaking of who had psoriasis. I don't have any of those things, but maybe it's because of all these things I've been doing all these years. Who knows? Absolutely. Absolutely. Could be. 
And not for nothing, um, you, you mentioned Raw briefly, and we only have about a minute mm-hmm. left in this segment. Uh, I'm actually friends with somebody, uh, Lisa Wilson, who's been a great influence. She runs something called the Raw Food Institute up in Connecticut, Simsbury, Connecticut. She takes you within a week. I went there uh, about a year and a half ago. You drink the green drinks. She has chefs from uh, San Francisco and everything creating these incredible raw meals for you. And you just follow this thing. I lost 23 pounds in a week. I felt so energized. Uh, my vitality came back. My vascularity, my, my blood pressure, everything was perfect. Just from drinking and drinking and eating healthy. And I have to say, uh, I'm now going up uh, to shoot with her again. I, I did some photography because, you know, I'm a photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, shooting actually now for doTERRA oils, which is a big, of course, company. I know all about them, yes. Right, I, so I don't buy doTERRA, but I do know that brand. Right, and so now I'm getting commercial accounts from the work I did with her. So what's exciting is here I am doing something I love, but at the same time getting healthy. And I'm, here's the cool thing, and this is where I'm leading up to. I see people in her course that come in with cancer, with you name it, totally reverse their conditions and give their testimonies after following her protocols. And again, people... This is without doctors. This is just simply eating the right foods, giving the body what it needs, the tools that it needs to repair itself, go into homeostasis, and balance. Oh, this is the clock, uh, the time. We're going to come back to the last segment. We're going to keep it in here. And yeah, stay tuned. Frequency Radio. And welcome back. We're at the last segment of Perceptions Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jonathan. Tonight, my guest is Patricia Steer from Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And I just dragged in here, Mr. Tomorrow. G'day, g'day from sunny Melbourne. How are we, everybody? Doing good. Hello. Awesome. Nice to talk to you. Likewise, Patricia. Nice to hear your voice on Jonathan's show. It's really been fun. And this is my birthday today. I'm 53 oh, today yes. at this very moment. So. Uh-oh. Yeah, 53. Right. Yeah. You are lying. It's 35, right? You got the numbers mixed. <laughs> no. 53. Happy I always, birthday to you. Thank you. I'm, I've, I remember thinking 53 was old when my mother was 53 when I was much younger. But I, I don't see the age, age at, you know, people always say it's just a number. I don't mean that. What I'm saying is today's 53 is really something like 35, really. It is. For all of us, if we take care of ourselves. If you take care of yourself. <laughs> exactly. Which That's a lot true. of people do not, unfortunately. But there's, it's, there's never, it's never too late, no matter even if you have something serious like multiple, multiple sclerosis or a heart issue. It's never too late. You can take little steps and move yourself toward health if you wish to. Some people don't care. They're like, whatever, I'm fine like I am, living like I am. Yeah, I have that uh, problem too with some of my family members. I know they could be a lot healthier, and they are showing their age big time. And I, you know, just try, even dropping hints, they just don't want to borrow it. They know where my angle's going. I don't know. Maybe it's my delivery, but uh, they do not want to hear it. But hey, you can't, you can't force them. Well, I hear people ask me in comments after they see my YouTube videos, pe- naysayers, negative people saying, "You must have had lots of plastic surgery." And it's, you know, no, it's not plastic surgery at all. It's, it's eating, um, I, eating well and, you know, taking can, care of myself. I got to chime in on that. As a and I'm not against plastic surgery if people want to have it. <laughs> I wouldn't put anybody down for it. You know, as a, as a photographer who shoots in L.A. and Miami and such, like, I've seen enough women to recognize plastic surgery. And I will go on the record and say you have not had any. 
no. And yeah. and if and when I ever do, for whatever reason that may be, I would definitely put it on the air. Like, <laughs> <laughs> not would you, the surgery, would, would you go on there? But, would you go on there with the black eyes and the and the bandages and everything? Yeah, I guess. I mean, okay, I don't ever want to have plastic surgery, but I would never say I wouldn't. You know, people have horrible things happen to them, and then they need plastic surgery. Or they're born with a, a cleft lip and right. plastic oh, surgery. You know, it's all acceptable. I would never put anybody down for doing anything they want to with their own body. Sure. So, sure. No, I, I the think thing is, go ahead. Your turn. I was just going to say the thing is, Patricia, when it comes to people who think, no, you can't look that good at that age. You must have plastic surgery. A lot of people just don't actually realize how good you can look at any age. People just accept growing old in this pill laden society and it's just it's pretty sad really i take zero pills zero medications um and i yeah. will hopefully always keep it that way um i have aspirin in my house it's willow bark powdered willow bark and that's a- actually what aspirin is if you're not buying a pharmaceutical wait, wait, wait it's not it's not salicylic acid it's not yeah there is that too but there is a willow bark <laughs> aspirin yes no, i know um, willow bark is. yeah Exactly, but it's you a, and I have that for an extreme headache, which is the only illness I'm really plagued with is that, sure. and uh, you know other things like that. Some ache and pain, I'll take that. And by the way, I brought Stephen in. I, I wouldn't do this with a guest typically, um, but Stephen, you're you're vegan too, right? I mean, you're you're a healthy eater. I'm a very healthy eater. I I wouldn't call myself vegan because I do still eat eggs, um, but I I go even. Well, I wouldn't say I would go further than vegan because I'm not vegan, but I always try to st- to stick with raw um, fruit and vegetables. I never cook it. I always juice it as well. I juice uh, a lot too. It's just this, it's the best way to get all the nutrients, and, and there's no point in cooking it. I mean, we've all seen curly in photography, and if you haven't, I'd recommend anyone seeing it. It, it shows you the life force that is in everything, and the minute you cook it it's above 44 degrees, it's going to kill it. Microwave even worse, actually. Oh yeah, it just completely distorts the DNA. Of the but food. I do eat oatmeal somewhat frequently. I mean, it's an organic, steel-cut o- mm. oatmeal, and that is cooked. You know, it's got boiling water for a couple of minutes on it. Um, those are the comfort foods. I do like coffee. Um, no way. Uh, when you get coffee, so, do you make sure it's mold-free? Like you get quality coffee? Yes. Yes, I do. And you know, I, 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 I do the, the my, you know, I guess oatmeal and coffee. Those are weaknesses of mine. I'm not against cooked food. I understand it would be way better if I was all raw, and I would have no problem going all raw. If something happened to me in my life, and where I was developing some kind of illness, I would be raw in a second. And you know, I haven't had a cold for. Oh God! Maybe ten years. I've never had the flu. No, wait, you, you you brought up a good point. You saw the, uh, the the work of Dr. Lorraine Day, right? And she had that softball sized tumor on her chest, and she. I've seen many things like that, and people have cured themselves yep. with their diet and and that sort of thing. It's also a mindset as well. Absolutely, it's a mindset. So, I mean, I am not a health expert. I've only used myself as a guinea pig. And just try to do the best I can. I could be way better than I am. I could work out every day. I don't. Um, I could, you know, do many more things than I do. Because, like I said, sometimes I'll have coffee and oatmeal. That's not raw. I mean, it's not, it's not, not junk food, but, you know, it's, I could do better. And then other days I go on this, you know, kick where I'm doing, uh, I do, I make a lot of smoothies. I'll take kale and, you know, organic kale and uh, organic bananas, some organic strawberries and some, uh, some uh, distilled water and then use my blender and blend it up and then I'll have that. And it's a huge, you know, blender sized green drink. Um, it doesn't have to be those ingredients. It can be variations of that. I'll put turmeric in it or some fresh turmeric, some fresh ginger, and that'll be my, my meal. And then, you know, the next day I might have a, a big plate of spaghetti with red sauce. So, you know, I mix it up. I'm a regular person. Still have those cravings for those things like spaghetti or coffee, oatmeal. Just reminding me of talk about childhood, you know. <laughs> but no yeah, meat, that's <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing too. A lot of people think you have to go to extremes with all these fad diets. You have to go from being someone completely overweight, eats McDonald's every day to this strict diet. It's not about that. It's, you know, a lot of things like eating stuff in uh, regulation. uh, Sorry, not regulation. What's the word? In um, moderation. Moderation. That's what I'm thinking of. 
just see things in moderation that gets thrown around so much and it's almost frowned upon now because it's just like yeah whatever i hear that with every fat diet it's like actually no if you if you stick to something healthy most of the time you could go out and not have a worry in the world and eat these things it's just it's fine you don't have to be a nazi when it comes to i shouldn't say that word because that <laughs> that, that could well, mean anything nowadays hey um, exactly yeah. well you you don't even have to have the medical procedures that they tell you to have like um a colonoscopy and of course mm. i don't want anybody to think i'm a doctor don't take my advice i don't even know why i have to put this caveat in here but if you know your doctor might tell you to get one and you should get one but i don't want to have but, one. By the way, i don't want to have a mammogram i'm not going to have a mammogram well, no, it's funny you say that because just this year and most recently, um, the AMA or, you know, for, for women, they've said they've changed the screenings uh, to every other year now. And they found that for the longest time, they said, you know, you're actually creating uh, conditions in the breast when you squeeze it like that, that if there is a tumor, it'll metastasize from the, you know, doing that. Uh, and you're this, irradiating your chest. Absolutely. And then, you know, the same thing with um, guys, at least, you know, having a prostate exam or whatever, colonoscopy, um, they, they find that uh, that area, if there is any trace cancer, they did a study on, on men in Europe, and it's the slowest uh, growing cancer that there is, that it takes 30 to 40 years to present, so that many people die with, with prostate cancer in a sense, but Indeed. it doesn't affect their body. So what happens is when you start cutting, you start you know, letting it spread, then it becomes an issue. And it's unfortunately that people are so invasive. Um, I'll give you one more. When you do a test, like a blood test, and you do a blood fasting to you know, uh, you're checking for glucose levels and possible diabetes. Mm -hmm. I brought this question up during the Raw Food Institute. And I said, what if somebody gifted you with a blood, blood exam, a blood workup every uh, day so that you can see the different stages of your body 365 days a year, meaning changes in the season, changes in your exercise regime, whatever. You would start to see maybe the body um, in states of where it's looking like it's affected by cancer or diabetes, but it could be in process of processing something out. Similar to like where if you, you know, somebody has a cold, at what stage of the cold are they at? Are they just getting the germs? Are they then fighting the germs? Or are they on the end of it? You see what I'm saying? Like we, we do blood, blood work and stuff at different intervals that we don't know if we're actually catching something. Or the same as when you have antibodies or teeter count and things like that. Is it something that was you know, present recently? Or is it something that was long-term you built up antibodies against? Give you an example, like women um, who go in before they have a baby, uh, and they'll say, well, you know, the mother can't give this to her child because she's already uh, immune to it. She's already built up antibodies. So a high count doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It means that you've built up immunity. So again, when they get too invasive and they start cutting and poking and prodding and irradiating, that's when you're not allowing your body to do what it does best, naturally healing itself with natural foods. I'm done with my preaching. Well, I'm I'm all I'm with you all the way. I, and people who aren't on this path, it, this is not, not in any way any condemnation because we've all been there. I grew up having steak and lobster and pot roast and, and pot? baked chicken and <laughs> no pot roast. <laughs> the roast the roast dropped off. It's like I had pot. <laughs> you were definitely yeah, roasted. Served, <laughs> yeah, exactly. My mom served us a nice pot salad. It was great. Awesome. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. I, I had all that normal food growing up. I grew up in Michigan and in Florida in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, well, you know, and I ate normal stuff like everyone else. And I'm sure I damaged my body. And, um, I mean, I'm a redhead, natural redhead with fair skin. I went out to the beach in Florida with the other girls who had darker skin and laid out and tried to get a tan and turned, you know, beet red. And, you know, I'm lucky that I didn't, whatever, my constitution protected me against getting some of the things that have happened to other people. But it, it does, you can at any age of your life start turning things around and just making your life on earth better so that you can use your, your talents to you know help what? other people and yourself I don't and want, have fun. I don't want to cut you off but like Mark does with the mailbag. We got a caller. Can we take this now that we got like three people on the line here? Sure. Is that all right, Steve? Don't ask me. Yeah, if go you for should. it. All right. Hey, caller, uh, who's calling into the radio? Felipe. Felipe. Wait Hello, a Felipe. Hello, Felipe. Hello, mate. Is this Felipe Rose? Yes. What are you doing up this late? I saw your message. Hi, it was the lady that's speaking. And that's my friend Patricia Steer. Oh, Patricia, hi. Hello, Felipe. You were saying you were hi. You were you were talking about your while I was on hold waiting in queue. You were talking about your constitution, and I'm thinking to myself. Ah, she was just a soul sister. 
<laughs> well, I guess I am. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. I'll take yeah. it. Nice to hear. Nice to nice to nice to say hello. Yeah, you know what? I was I was telling Felipe to call in. If if nobody knows, um, can I can I let it out, Felipe? Can I can I share? Oh, cool. I want. I was like on your. I was on your page today, then then. Oh, right on. Uh, yeah, no, Felipe comes in for acupuncture and all that. But more importantly, when we were talking about radio and and ra- records and all that in the last segment, uh, Felipe is the Indian guy from the Village People. Oh, okay. Wow. So that's uh, a part of all of our lives all over the known world, really, because we all know this. We all know village people songs. We can instantly picture the village people in our mind. Weddings, bar mitzvahs, (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) It's awesome. Blessing. The blessing with that is that everybody has a memory of where they were, or or when they introduced us to a younger generation, even more so, even like Kai Johnson, like when we met, like how long ago was that? Like six years ago? Oh my God, yeah, I have this video clip of them I put together and I'll put it up uh, at some point. And they're playing Battle Tops in my house. And I set it to the music of Gladiator. It's funny as hell. Well, the thing is that, you know, the thing is that John, because we're friends, John knows me as just like the guy, but uh, but like literally, I I travel the world with like with the band. Like we are, oh my god! And, you know, has there been a book that? Has there been a book that came out? The story behind the Village People, like you know what went on when you were on a tour bus and the the saga of the band. You're like, were you- would you like in my house listening to the phone call I got this morning? This, this is like exactly what's going on in his life. Yeah, she just nailed it, Felipe. A reputable, a reputable, a reputable, a reputable um, book agent. Reputable. Uh, we finally caught up, and he said, "If I told you that I was doing your book right now, and what I'm about to tell you, I couldn't even make that up." Because he said, to the left of you, you have the ex-lead singer doing the Lifetime movie of his life. To the right of you, you have the ex-producer who discovered me with the other producer doing a motion picture, and he rattled off names of the movie of the director. He said, what would you do? I'd say, and then I said to him, hmm, so let's see. Is his story his story? So it's three stories. How's that old saying? As that old saying goes, there's always your version, my version, and the truth. <laughs> so I just kept quiet. I said, just keep talking. I guess I'm just in the middle here. Yeah, so it's pretty, it's insane right now. The 70s are still even more ramped up than ever around the world. And the, yeah. um, No, wait a minute, wait, wait, Felipe. Being... Felipe, how, long, how, how many years have, have the village people been performing? Oh, my God. Oh. God. Um, Something like a, I think I remember you guys came out in 76 or 77. I might be wrong, but around then, I think. 77. Yeah, he's supposed to, it should have been over my house helping me hang up gold and platinum records. Yeah, that's what he wanted me but to do last week, and I was too busy. <laughs> <laughs> he's got 15, he's got 15 a, gold <laughs> records, and those are the ones he didn't give away. I mean, well, nah, that's why I can't put, I don't have a, a straight eye. If I'm going to nail something on the wall, I'm really, I don't have that. You don't have a straight eye? You don't have a straight eye, not even for me, as cute as I am? (laughs) (laughs) Um. Straight eye for the picture hanging guy. (laughs) I am a macho man. I'm a macho man, (laughs) goddammit. I couldn't help it on the phone. Huh? Who's the other person on the phone? Oh, this is my friend Steve. Ra- he's, he's my co-host. Mr. Tomorrow, I call him, because he's already in tomorrow. Uh, hi, Steven. No, I meant like straight eye, like when I nail something to the wall to hang it straight. If I'm going to accompany it with another frame, forget it. No, I'm bad at that, too. I have to actually hire somebody oh. to actually measure it out for me, because I don't even want to deal with it. I'll have 50 holes in the wall to hang one picture if well, I do it myself. When I, when I nail something to the wall, it usually yells out, <laughs> oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> Oh no! Hey, no. Hey. <laughs> yeah, John, John and Melissa, they have really good. What's this feng shui wall feng shui? Like everything is eye level. Like I'm going to ask you, Patricia. So when you nail something on a wall, 
even if it's classic stuff or something you love, do you put it up above your head or do you nail it to the wall eye level? I have some things at eye level and sometimes some things slightly above eye level. It all depends on the composition. Maybe eight pictures in a row might be hung so that you know they all can be slightly in eye level. Felipe, Felipe, you're it's actually random. you guys are having a psychic communication. You've never seen her talk radio show on on air, but behind her is a oh, yeah, no, behind her, behind her on camera, she has a Wurlitzer machine, and above that, she has eight records that are perfectly symmetrical above it, it, it just like you're describing. Are you and she, kidding me? So then, she, so then she should be coming over. And that's what up I'm saying. Why don't, come on, fly up here. And <laughs> well, I can but easily I plan that, it, but I don't like to hang it. But, I, but I, I have a feeling that prior to me getting on and you interrupting me, Patricia, you guys were talking about food, right? The culture, the 70s, and, and all that, right? Were you we, talking about food and what we ate back then? We were just talking no, about food No, but anything. Fast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was just horrible what we were eating. <laughs> yeah. Like, Jesus. Half of the things I look at are like, uh, like McDonald's traveling through an airport. I really cannot believe the lines of what people are doing. Not to trash media, corporate, the corporate world, but I mean, let's face it. I mean, it's better to be organic, vegan, vegetarian, eat healthy, because everything that's so fucked and fried is so bad. Well, wait, by the way. By the way, you, you look more fit than ever. You and I kind of uh, lost touch for about a year or so, but you came back. You lost a lot of weight, and you're looking healthier and younger than ever. What are you doing? Thank you. I think it was more than a year. Maybe it was... We clicked off, and now we clicked back on. Yeah, yeah. I was going to get... I was going to get Steve. Is Steve, right? Is Steve your call? Yes. Steven. Yeah. Steve? Yes. Hello, mate. Is he still there? He, he's he's yes, calling in from is. Australia. Yes, there's a slight delay. Oh, right. I've been there 38 times. So I, I, I go to the Zen Den um, late last year, and um, uh, Melissa greets me at the door, and I she says, oh, hi. And then I turn, she says something to some guy that's right behind me, packing some things in a car. And I turn around, and John looks up at me. <laughs> I said... What are you doing here? He said, dude, this is our place. I was like, what? <laughs> Small, that's when we caught up again. Small world. Yeah. Very cool. I went to have my acupuncture. Yeah. Well, no, what are you doing? What are you doing health wise, though? Because you are on the road and everything. And we, um, Melissa, Patricia and I were speaking earlier how when you travel, sometimes it's hard to find healthy choices, uh, especially vegan, um, when you're on, you know, road. I don't know, Vegas to California, wherever. Uh, what do you do now to prepare for that? Um, I think that some of us and most of us, you carry protein powder, uh, you know, nutritional stuff, uh, you know, nuts and fruit that you can carry with you, lots of water. And sooner than later, and we're finding out now the way we we move around the world, we're finding now that more and more restaurants are offering you have uh, gluten-free, um, organic food, and so it, it's getting better and better. That's um, true. Or, or check, I check into the hotel, and then, like, uh, I'll unpack real quick, and then an hour later, I'm walking to find on Google, Whole Foods, or something organic, and, and uh, you'd be surprised. Hmm. That's cool. And so, where's Patricia? I'm here. <laughs> but where are you? In, in oh, I'm in Houston, in Texas. Texas. Houston, Texas. That's, cool. I'm not from Houston, but I happen to live here now. Houston and Dallas started the big trash disco movement in the 80s. Yeah, I can imagine that. I didn't live here then, but um, she she had a she had a, a she, she had a background in radio show. though. She had a background in broadcasting. Mm-hmm. Oh, very, very cool. So wait, did you spin any? Did you spin any um, Village People records? Not that I remember. I I started working for my dad's station in the eighties, and it might have been an oldie. Maybe uh, they called it an oldie at the time. Um, 
um, that would get occasional airplay, but I don't recall. It was more of a classic rock or rock and roll kind of station. So we played the Doobie Brothers and that sort of thing. The Eagles. Oh, I when I first started. I love classic. Classic yeah. rock is awesome. I think all music's good. Uh, some I can handle better than others. So. Oh, by the way, Felipe, can I tell the joke I always say? You won't get mad at me. Okay. I, I, I always, I always, I always say after forty years, they're no longer the village people; they're the, they're the village elders. <laughs> oh, that's oh. actually kind of funny, but you know, <laughs> I, I mean that lovingly. Actually, no, my dad actually made me laugh last year when I went home, and he said, "Son, you look good." He's the he's the native side of the family. He said, oh. "I said, oh." I'm, I'm all right. Just I'm counting the years, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fade out of the road and uh, and the and the VP thing. And he goes, "Oh, son, you have to stay till you're 80. Our people live long." So I'm like, F you, man." <laughs> he's very, <laughs> my, he's talking to my dad on the phone. My dad's hysterical. Here, your dad is funny. I, I talked to him on the phone before. <laughs> People don't retire yeah, at retirement age anymore. People continue doing what they love if they have a job they love as long as they can. I think that's great. Hey, look, Abe, no, Abe, Abe, Abe Vigoda just went to 94, God rest his soul, last week, but, you know, 94. Well, my dad says, yeah, God, my dad retired to what? Expire? And that's really true, though. Very there, true. I've known people. That have, that have retired, and then next thing you know, oh, did you hear the so-and-so? It's like, oh. that's why I don't ask, I don't ask how is so-and-so, because I don't want to hear bad news. But then when people see me, like when I see John, good to see you, I always say it's good to be seen. There you go. Hey, will you do me a favor, because this was a treat that you called in. I was going to sing happy birthday to Patricia, because it's her birthday today. But no. would you like, you? would you like... <laughs> would you like the honor? I would love to. Yes. All right. One, <laughs> two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. To you. Wow. <laughs> that was probably the most memorable birthday singing that I've ever experienced. There you go. Life. The Indian guy from the village people just sung happy birthday. <laughs> That's to you. never I, happened you know, before. You, know, you don't hear that every day. We got, we got, we got 30 birthday, seconds. We got 30 seconds. Make it count. Uh, Steve, I, I I sense the fear. You're sitting silently, and I'm no, no, no. He, he fell off. So he he fell off the edge of the fire. Stephen dropped. John and Patricia, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, letting me listen and, and letting me jump in. And I hope I can jump in earlier in the next couple of days or when I'm home. All right. Well, listen, I'll, I'll give you a call. I'll give you a call right after this this show. Hey, Patricia, last word. I'm sorry, we're right down to the end. Go ahead, Hi, Patricia. Everyone. What do you Jonathan, got? Jonathan, thank you for having me on Perceptions. And just, it was a great way to start my 53rd year on this flat earth. Awesome. Well, welcome. Happy birthday. And uh, let's do this again soon. I hope so. Thank right. you, Jonathan. Good night, everybody. <laughs>